part of a pretty high profile case where me and my co-defendants were facing 60 years in prison just for rescuing two baby piglets uh, and a turkey in Utah. And fortunately, I was able to plea out of that case. And as long as I stay out of trouble for the next couple of years, uh, the charges will all get dropped. Um, and I have a goal of using my scientific training to help animals uh, for the rest of my life. Uh, and I, I, one of my favorite things to do is to hang out with animals. So I'll start off with a few questions and folks can just answer these by um, putting like an asterisk in the chat um, or pressing like the yes button in the polls uh, like Joanna discussed. Um, so who here was at the Reichart Duck Farm uh, Open Rescue at last year's ALC? Okay. A couple of you. Um, it's a bunch of you. And then who has been to any rescue ever? Okay. And then finally, uh, who has ever met a rescued animal? Okay. Now that's basically like everyone. Uh, so these are incredible experiences that would not be possible if we didn't have homes to place these animals. Uh, I've worked on a couple rescues, and if you've worked on any rescues, you know that finding placement, finding a safe home that is long-term for animals, is one of the first steps of rescue and often one of the hardest parts. And safe homes continue to be urgently needed. I can tell you in DXC today, there are projects that we're not doing because there just aren't enough homes for all the animals. And, and additionally, at every rescue, there are animals who will die on these farms because there's just nowhere to home them. And that doesn't need to be the case. And if I do a good job today with this training, that won't be the case. So like Joanna said, this call goes until about seven o'clock. We'll probably finish early and have lots of time for questions. I've got a fair amount of ground to cover. There's going to be a special guest about halfway through, uh, so stay tuned for them. Um, and I'm just going to start out here. Let me present. Um, start out here with talking about why micro sanctuaries are important. And so I'm, I'm going to tell you about something that I, I don't tell a lot of people, and that is that when I was younger, I used to dream about starting a sanctuary. I pictured myself maybe my 40s or 50s, moving out to the country, uh, buying a couple acres of land, having a bunch of chickens, some pigs, some goats, maybe a couple of cows. And it would just be so relaxing. It would, you know, hanging out with the animals, taking care of them, be so fulfilling, watching the sunset. It's just like, it's just so idealistic. Um, and I'm here today to tell you to fuck this dream. It's probably not gonna happen. Um, it's, it's a huge cost to run a sanctuary, tens of thousands of dollars a year for food, medical expenses. You're gonna be reliant on donors forever, not to mention the cost of the land, you'll be in debt. It's honestly like running a business every day of your life and you, cannot, you can never get a day off. You're gonna be tied, tied to the sanctuary, working, really, really busy, and the only way you'll get a day off is if you're able to hire staff, which will cost even more money. You're gonna be isolated with, with the cost of land. You're gonna be way out there in the middle of nowhere. We're never gonna see you again. You're gonna, goodbye, you'll, be, you'll die and get eaten by the animals and that, that'll be the end of you. Um, and, and, if you and maybe more importantly, if you look at DXC's theory of change, sanctuaries don't play a central role. Yet there's also this tension because our work isn't possible without them. So, and I wanna unpack this a little bit and, and maybe, find a way to resolve this. And so I know I just crushed your dreams and cursed at you, and I hope you don't leave. Um, but there are, I think, solutions here. I think there are ways that this is still possible. And I want us to learn from dogs and cats in the US. There are more than 100 million dogs and cats in the US, and most of them live in single family homes, two or three at a time. Uh, it's, it's very normal for people to adopt you know, two or three dogs, but you don't see a lot of people with 10 or 20 dogs. There aren't really a lot of dog and cat sanctuaries. Um, and so that brings us to what is a micro sanctuary, which is basically how people live with cats and dogs, 
as companion animals, but instead with farmed animals. It's a scaled down sanctuary that won't bankrupt you, won't ruin your life. It'll be, it's feasible for anyone to handle. And most importantly, it fits into DXE's theory of change. Because critically, micro sanctuaries can be where the action is. They can be in cities like Berkeley, like Los Angeles, like New York, like all the other cities across the world where, prog where major legislative progress is, is taking place. And they can be where the activists are. You know, when I first started out as an activist, I was really, really scared to go to a protest. I mean, and I think we don't emphasize this enough. I'm, I'm very comfortable with protests now, but it's really intimidating to go to this thing where you might get arrested and like with these strangers you just met and it's just, it's a lot. Um, but so instead I went to a lot of sanctuary days and I found that really, really comfortable. I got to know people. Uh, I got to hang out with animals, which is basically what I wanted to do. Um, and it was just a way to meet people and a fun way to spend uh, a couple hours on a Sunday. And this is why, and this is another way that micro sanctuaries fit into DXC's theory of change, is they can be a place where an, a, a community of activists can form. Many, many cities are not lucky, to, lucky enough to have an animal rights center, but they can have micro sanctuaries, these places where new folks and old folks can come together, can talk, can meet, can hang out, and volunteer. Um, and then lastly, micro sanctuaries bring about cultural change. You know, sanctuaries are way out there, sort of out of sight, out of mind. It's easy to discount them, to forget them, to think about them as like a whole nother world. But, but micro sanctuaries are right here in the city, in the neighborhood, in someone's house with folks who seem just like you, just like me and you. Um, and they can't be discounted, they can't be ignored. And so I would argue that micro sanctuaries are a way that anyone can get involved and they're very effective and inviting for new folks. And so just to recap, for me, micro sanctuaries are effective because they're in cities where the, where the legislative change is happening, where the activists are. They're bringing people together, including new folks in a really um, exciting and safe way and they lead to cultural change. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about how micro sanctuaries mean different things to different stakeholders. And I first want to talk about we want to be effective, we want to be successful in getting uh, animal rights into the public, into the public mindset. And so I'm, I work in the medical sciences and I learned something really interesting where uh, about studies in smoking cessation. And that is basically studying how messages affect why people quit smoking or don't quit smoking. And if, if you grew up um, in the 90s or earlier, you'll probably remember these horrifying video um, commercials on TV with the guy with like the hole in his throat and he had to like touch the thing to talk because he had this trachea tube. Um, and they were just really, really disturbing messages. And the whole thing was like, don't smoke because if you smoke, you'll end up with me. And if you're currently smoking, you better stop smoking because you're gonna die and get cancer and all these terrible things are gonna happen to you. And, and those were really common in the 90s and early 2000s. And then some research came out from Yale in 2008 that showed that those messages, those what are called negative framing messages, aren't that effective. Um, and instead, if you look at most smoking ads today, they feature like some happy, strong, smiling man who named Jim, who just stopped smoking, you know, two years ago, and now he's healthy and happy, and, and everything is wonderful. And it's a way more positive framing. Um, and, and it's because of the research. Now, in animal rights, you know, we haven't had that same rigor of research. I don't know what messaging is most effective, but I'd be willing to bet that there is a big role for positive messaging to play in animal rights. And right now we have a huge amount of negative messaging. We have slaughter footage, we have people, um, people talking about disease and filth in these factory farms, the horrifying conditions, the number of animals dying, how many animals are being killed every year, you know, all these terrible statistics, but we can also have a lot of positive framing. And that's exactly what micro sanctuaries allow us to do. 
They are a way of a, a place of continuous content of happy, smiling animals living how they should be living, um, living their best life, basking in the sun. Um, and you know, if you've been on the internet any time in the past 10 years, you'll know that it's just full of like smiling, happy animals. Uh, and so that I think is a really important uh, direction that we can move as animal rights activists. And the more micro sanctuaries we have, the more content we'll be able to create, the more um, people will be able to reach with this positive framing message. So that's one reason that micro sanctuaries are useful and important to activists. In terms of the animals themselves, they're obviously a stakeholder. And I want to tell you a somewhat sad story. Um, when we first rescued our hens, there were four of them. And one of them, one day, Leonardo, um, poor Leonardo, she, she was just not the same that day. She didn't have the same pep in her step. She didn't have the, um, the, that, that sparkle in her eye. She looked slow. And I remember looking at her and thinking, hmm, we should, we should watch Leonardo. We should make sure that she gets better. Um, and I watched her over the next uh, couple of days and she seemed okay. And about a week later, I noticed she was really looking much slower. She wasn't walking normally. She was, uh, she really had a, a, something, something was up. So I called our avian vet out in Oakley. I made an appointment um, for later in that week. That was the first they could schedule us. Unfortunately, the next day, Leonardo died. And that was really hard for us. And the only good thing that I can take out of that is that we learned a lot from Leonardo dying. We learned a lot about what it means for a hen to not look healthy. Um, it's, it's not like cats and dogs. Cats and dogs are predatory animals. They're, they're not afraid to show when they're, when they're sick. Whereas hens are more like, are more typically, you know, ev evolutionarily speaking, are prey animals. They hide their illnesses. We also had an autopsy done on Leonardo and realized that she died due to an infected egg that had um, gotten stuck inside her and caused an infection that spread. And so now we, knowing that they're prone to that, that they have this pre-existing condition, we uh, implant our hens. And I'll talk about that more later. Um, that's a really important thing where uh, we learned something about the animals that allowed us to help animals better. Um, and a similar story uh, that some of you might be familiar with is Edna, one of the first pigs that DXC rescued, and she lived at Happy Hen uh, down in San Diego, uh, one of the first pigs that she rescued, and she recently had a terrible leg infection. And Zoe and Shurston went from vet to vet, even brought her to the best vets in the world, Davis. And the best they could do was to say, uh, uh, at least that is the standard of care. Um, most of our professional care information that we have about these animals is from the industry. And the industry is not used to seeing animals live much more than two years, if not a couple months for many animals. So we have very little understanding in a professional capacity for how these animals, um, how these animals can live long, happy lives. And fortunately, this story has a happy ending. They did eventually find a vet who was willing to do the surgery to repair Edna's, um, Edna's back legs, which you can see in, that sec in the photo on the right, have casts on them. She's now getting better at Happy Hen, um, and hopefully this will be a happy story in the end. Um, but I really want to um, dig home that this is important research that we are missing out on by not understanding these animals better. Uh, I'm a big supporter of, of someone like Bernie Sanders who, who advocates for Medicare for all. I wanna be able to go into a hospital to get my broken arm fixed and not have it cost anything. And if we're serious about animal rights, we're talking about Medicare for all, not just for humans, but for animals as well. Uh, I wanna be able to bring a hen to a hospital or a veterinary hospital clinic and have them treated with good treatment correctly so that they can live a long, happy life. But we're just not going to be able to do that if we don't start laying that foundation now. So that's why micro sanctuaries are important for animals, is that we can start um, making, a, making an effort to get vets to better understand the long-term care of these animals. Because if there's a demand for that, the vets will fill it. It's just right now there isn't that demand. Um, and then finally, um, I want to talk about the benefit of 
of micro sanctuaries to the third stakeholder. So the first one was the activists, the second one were the animals, the third one is society at large, is all these folks who are not animals and are not activists, most people, most humans. Um, and, and this is a story of one of my housemates, um, not, not the one pictured here, but someone I'm gonna call Dan. And Dan moved into our house in January, shortly after Joanna moved out. And Dan, um, he was sort of your typical vegan. He was plant, he identified as plant-based, someone who's doing it for his health. We probably know a lot of people like Dan. Um, folks who, you know, he identified as a spiritual person who was part of his you know, daily health practice to eat a plant-based diet, but by no means did he identify as an activist. Now we have uh, another housemate in the picture here who is Jude. Uh, some of you may know Jude, and Jude has this awesome practice of this nearly daily yoga with the hens out in the front yard. I really love the hen yoga. It leads to a lot of great photos. Um, and it's really great for Jude too. And the hens seem to enjoy it too. Um, and one day Jude invited Ben to go and, and participate in this hen yoga with, with Jude, not really thinking that it would lead to much. Um, and, so, and so Dan did that, he, he did the chicken yoga. And I remember Dan coming in looking completely transformed. He went from seeing the hens as just scenery, as just, you know, these objects that are that he happens to live with, even though he's vegan, uh, he just saw them as things. Went from seeing them as things to seeing them as individuals. Really took the time over that hour-long yoga to connect with the hens, see them as individuals, and that's a huge, important switch that we that we all have to make as activists of seeing seeing these uh, animals as instead of property, instead of property as actual living individuals that we are sharing this world with. Um, and even folks who are vegan, if they're not activists, they often don't have that mindset. And I don't see how that's I don't see how that's possible without um, without animals and directly interacting with them. And so that's something that animals and micro sanctuaries, being so close to these huge population hubs, can offer the world is these transformative experiences of seeing of going from seeing animals as objects as property to seeing them as individuals with their own rights their own interests their own desires great so we're about halfway through um, and i'm gonna introduce now our special guest uh, let me see if i can find them give me one second This is our special guest, Donatello. This is Donatello, and she's just gonna hang out here, maybe. Um, Donatello is one of the three hens I live with, and she was rescued. Oh no, don't leave Donatello. She was rescued at the 2018 Sunrise ALC, uh, AL 2018 ALC, at, in where we. Oh, oh, she's she's heading out. She was. <laughs> Um, we rescued her from Sunrise Egg Farm in Petaluma, um, and she now lives with me here. She was in, oh, there she goes. Well, she's a little camera shy. Um, maybe she'll come back. Um, she now lives at the micro sanctuary, um, and on the left here, we have a photo of where she used to be um, in, in this horrible dark shed where they had no direct sunlight, no grass, and that's exactly what she loves to do. I'll go out in the morning, um, and and folks who live with um, folks who live with companion animals understand this. These these animals are like are like my my children. I mean, I see them. I go out in the kitchen. They're out in the sun with their wings spread, and I open the door, and it's just like the best way to start your day ever. Um, and and where she, when I think about where she came from, where she didn't have access to peck at the grass and scratch around and dust bathe and lay in, the, lay in the sun and do all these things that allow her to have such a chill, relaxed, happy life. Um, it just, it's amazing to see that transformation. It's like, it's like living in a movie every day, um, seeing this character who overcame so much terrible stuff to now live a happy, fulfilling life. Um, and it's, for me personally, it's really empowering. It makes me want to do more. It makes me want to continue doing my activism. 
and, and do things like host these trainings. Um, and so I'm gonna show you a really quick video here. Uh, this is gonna be a one minute video uh, clip. And if you wanna see the full video, we can, we can send it out. Um, let's see. Give me one second here. Hopefully you can hear the sound. This is a video that we made, and I'll, I'll tell you more in a second. Donatello, Raphael, and Michelangelo. They're just three of thousands of hens who were trapped in cages. I quickly learned that Donatello isn't just any chicken. She is sassy, curious, and so funny. Starting a micro sanctuary was easier than I thought it would be. It takes less work to care for these three hens than it would for a dog, which is great because I don't have a lot of spare time. It's been about a year and a half since I've started this project, and it's been one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. I've learned so much. I didn't know that hens like Donatello were bred to lay eggs almost every day which is really taxing on their bodies. You see, in the wild, chickens only lay about 10 to 20 eggs a year. Donatello is now on birth control, which stops her from laying eggs for several months. As soon as she stops laying, she grows new feathers and looks much healthier. She also stops crying out in the morning when she used to. Okay, uh, if folks wanna see the rest of the video, it's on the DXE main page. Um, posted this about two months ago. Uh, Christina Liu, who many of you may know, uh, she put this video together. It's gotten over 100,000 views, um, over 1,000 shares, 2,000 likes, um, been really successful. And we would love to make more content like this, more positive messaging content. Um, and that's possible if we have more micro sanctuaries. Okay, so like I said, we're about, about halfway through. Um, and so I'm giving this talk, and I wouldn't be giving this talk if I didn't believe that there was a role for everyone in micro sanctuaries, regardless of your experience, regardless of your living situation. And I'm gonna cover now four main ways that you can participate in micro sanctuaries. And they are one, which is opening your micro sanctuary, um, two, fostering rescued animals. The third is volunteering at a sanctuary, either at a volunteer day or uh, sort of babysitting the hens or, or other animals while, while someone is away. And then the fourth is fundraising or donating um, for medical care. And uh, in this talk, I'm mostly covering hens because there are a lot of hens who, who have need and we run into a lot of hens who need home. This helps or that can live with as companion animals. So I moved to Berkeley in grad school, uh, or I moved to Berkeley in fall of 2016 for grad school, and I pretty quickly got involved in animal rights here. By early 2017, I became really interested in starting, well, in, I didn't even know what a micro sanctuary was at that point, but I wanted to live with hens. Oh, and here, let me, let me change the uh, share back. Um, I know sometimes it's good. And so um, I really wanted to live with hens and for a bunch of months, I, but I didn't really do anything. I didn't know what to do. The steps weren't very clear. I just sort of had this vague feeling that I wanted to live with hens. And then one day something really great happened and I met uh, someone folks might know, Cristobal Van Breen, who, who runs a lot of nonviolence workshops. And they also wanted to live with hens. And we were like, well, this is great. Let's move in together somehow and adopt some hens. And that was transformational because when there's two of us, it's so much easier to hold each other accountable, to work together on things. It just moves when there's another person there. Um, and so that's exactly what we did. We moved in. Uh, we found a place where we could have hens and we uh, for a while sort of sat vacant 
And then an opportunity came up to foster some hens. We fostered two hens named Tony and Harper. They were um, Cornish breed hens, so the ones who are raised for their flesh. And we actually fostered them in a spare room in the house. And this was a really, really important experience. It made us realize that we can do this, that we want to do this. We learned a lot. We learned that we don't want to actually have hens living permanently inside the house, that that was just really messy and too difficult. Um, but it was a really important learning lesson. And then by March of 2018, we had built a coop in our side yard. We had a lot of, friend, a lot of help from friends, especially uh, Trevor Slack and Amanda Ruberg. Uh, they're huge, huge help in their carpentry skills. They're able to donate a lot of the materials. Um, so we built this really solid coop really cheaply. Um, and then we just sort of waited for a couple months. And then, as I said, the 2018 ALC came about. And at the end of that, uh, we had that mass open rescue at Sunrise Egg Farm, uh, where we rescued something like 40 hens, and four of them came to live with us at Jumanji. And so that's how I got into micro sanctuaries. Um, so like I said, there's these four ways to participate. Um, the first is, of course, starting your own micro sanctuary. Um, and I, I want to talk about a few things real quickly with this. And that is that, there, that micro sanctuaries come in multiple sizes. So on the right, you have Jumanji micro sanctuary. And we have about a six foot by 20 foot run, um, which is enough space for our three hens. Um, or four hens, but wouldn't want a lot more than that. Um, and then on the left, we have another micro sanctuary in Berkeley. We're really lucky to have two micro sanctuary, two micro sanctuaries here, and that is uh, Hens of the Hills, uh, run by Deirdre uh, Duhan, as well as uh, her daughter Rachel Arima. And Deirdre has about ten hens there, um, and you can see that they have a whole big yard, although they really only use part of it. Um, you'll notice one critical component of both of these is a coop. It's really important to have a safe place for hens to sleep at night. They're very vulnerable at night. They don't see well. They get really sleepy. Um, they can sort of be easily taken by, by predators. And so we have a coop. Deirdre actually has just a, a room in her house that opens to the outside that the hens then go in at night. That works also. Um, we rent our own place, and I know that's a concern for some people, but it's really just like having cats or dogs. You can rent places that allow cats and dogs, um, and then, you know, if, if you leave, you take the animals with you. Um, and Deirdre uh, owns her own place. Uh, in terms of daily time, it, it's not a very big time expense. It, it really is less than having a dog. Um, chickens are a lot like cats, except you have to let them out in the morning. And so we spend about five minutes in the morning, me or someone else in the house, letting them out of the coop, uh, cleaning their food, cleaning, uh, giving them fresh water, and, and just hang out with them. Um, and then at night, we let them into the coop, and that takes like a minute. Um, and obviously, we spend a lot more time with them, um, but they're, they're not like dogs. They're not going to come up to you like seeking attention. They're, they're more like cats. Um, and then in terms of daily, or in terms of costs, I estimate that for our hens, we spend something like 30 to $40 a month uh, for, for the three of them. So it's comparable to having like three cats or, or a dog. Um, it's not a huge cost. And that covers food, bedding um, for inside the coop, as well as straw and some treats. Um, so that's starting your own micro sanctuary. And these are pretty, you know, pretty fast summaries. This is just to get you excited, to get you interested in what's possible. Uh, there, we have a lot more detail online and I'm always happy to chat with people to talk about uh, all the possibilities. So the second way to get involved is fostering. Um, it's probably the fastest, easiest, and most fun way to sort of test drive what it's like to have a micro sanctuary. And to give you an example, uh, we have this um, Finding Fosters network, which we just started and I'll tell you about in a, in a minute. Um, but we have a hen who currently needs help in the California area. Um, and so that hen, we will eventually find a long-term place for her to stay. But in the meantime, before we find that long-term home, she's going to need somewhere to crash for a couple of days to a week. And that's where fostering comes in. It's, it's providing a temporary home where animals can, can live safely um, just for a couple of days to a couple of weeks. 
And we have a list of fostering supplies, things that you probably already have at home. Um, and uh, often it's if you have a spare, a spare bathroom or maybe a laundry room that the hens can, can stay in, that works perfectly fine. You don't need like a full coop. The third way is through sanctuary sitting or volunteering. This is a fo photo of Christina, who uh, sanctuary sits for Deirdre often. And this is a way for you as a potential uh, future micro sanctuary runner to sort of walk, uh, walk a day in the shoes of a micro sanctuary owner um, to sort of see if this is the right lifestyle for you. And it also lets the micro sanctuary owner go on vacation or maybe take care of some stuff out of town, um, all these things. And helps you build your reputation as someone who's dependable, as reliable, that people can count on. And depending on who you're uh, working with, you may learn a bit about animal care too. And then in terms of volunteering, that's very similar. Um, in the Bay Area, we have, we used to have, before this whole COVID-19 thing happened, we used to have monthly volunteer days, either at, at Jumanji Micro Sanctuary, where I live, or at Hens of the Hills, where Deirdre lives, um, where we would build community, we'd have new folks come, they could learn basic animal care skills, basic carpentry skills. We recently installed um, a new perch for our hens that's more grippy and easier them, for them to sleep on, a little bigger. And that you know, involved basic you know, power drills, things like that. Um, so it's a really good way for people to get hands-on experience with the hens, as well as building community. And then lastly is fundraising and donating. This is the fourth way to get involved. And here's a fundraiser that uh, Rachel Arima started for uh, her hen Ariel, who is one of the hens rescued from Sunrise. And just like our hens are very susceptible to these reproductive issues. So they're, they're fundraising for an implant. And this is something they didn't really expect that to need to do. So they're fundraising. Uh, and this was a successful fundraiser. They were able to implant Ariel. Um, and in general, fundraising and donating is really great for folks who are social media savvy, who are maybe a little younger and can't start a micro sanctuary right now. Um, and additionally, if you're someone who loves the idea of there being more micro sanctuaries, but you know, you're just not the kind of person who can start one, maybe you are moving a lot or just have a crazy schedule, you can donate to micro sanctuaries and sort of live vicariously. And just by supporting them and showing that there's a lot of support, more micro sanctuaries will pop up. Um, so we're getting towards the end of this presentation. Um, I do want to cover a question that we always get, um, and that is about implants. And so I just want to play this video real quick of an implanting procedure um, in this hen. Um, give me one second. And this will be a real short clip that I think will uh, clear up a lot of a lot of questions that people often ask about implants. Um, so this is from a sanctuary actually in France, but the implants are all the same. Um, and so. Thank you. Okay. Are you ready? Oh. Good girl. <laughs> okay, so that was, and, and I know it's a little stilted on the, um, it's a little jittery in the video, but I hope folks could see, um, and that was a vet uh, implanting a hen with birth control implant, and this is basically a, a rice-sized little uh, thing, is that, is that, that's what the implant is, this is about the size of a piece of rice, it goes right under the skin and it releases uh, what's called a GnRH agonist, which then binds to a part of the body called the pituitary gland and prevents uh, certain hormones from being released. And this is used in a lot of animals. It's even used in humans to treat, treat things like cancer, to treat heavy menstrual cycles. Um, and for in, in hens, what this does is it completely stops them from laying eggs. And this leads to um, them not having uh, as many reproductive issues. 
and they are expensive and that is an issue and not all hens need to be implanted it depends on the hens if you're not able to implant your hens it's perfectly fine you're still a good person and a good micro sanctuary operator um, but if you're able to that's also really great uh, it may save you some money in the long run as well um, and i want to highlight uh, one group called the micro sanctuary resource center um, and they have uh, some uh, resources uh, online, and I just want to highlight two funds that they have um, where they actually give out money for people to start micro sanctuaries. And one of them is the Startup Fund, and I think it's about $500 you can apply for it. They have quarterly funding applications, and they'll give you money to start a micro sanctuary. And this will cover things like the coop, getting a feeder, a water, um, some basic supplies, um, and that can be really helpful. Um, and then what I've applied to, I've applied for the implant fund uh, twice now. And so I was able to get $500 um, each time to implant our hens. Um, and that was really helpful. Now I should say that the Micro Sanctuary Resource Center, I know members of their board are not fans, are not big fans of DXC, or at least that was the case, or DXC leadership. Um, but you know, I'm all about positivity and uh, I just wanna highlight that there, there's some good work being done um, here. Um, even though there's conflict otherwise, perhaps. Um, um, so that's a, that's a resource that you can look into if, if you're seriously thinking about starting a micro sanctuary. Um, and like I said, we're, we're reaching the end now. Um, and if you're, if you're sitting there deciding how to participate, um, here, are some, here are some ways to think about it. Um, if you're thinking about a micro sanctuary, I think your living situation is the most important um, thing to consider. Um, because you, you do need some access to outdoors, but you also want to be close enough to a city to be uh, able to have people over, to have uh, work days, to be a hub for other activists. And so that's something to consider. Um, and yeah. so I just want to review uh, what we talked about that micro sanctuaries fit into our theory of change by being in cities where the activists are. Um, they build community by bringing folks together, bringing new folks together who are not involved uh, in, a, in a way that is welcoming and inviting. And then bringing about cultural change where animals are normalized as companion animals. And it's not just you know, these people out in farm country, but it's just regular folks um, like your neighbors who, who happen to live with chickens that they love. Um, and there are four main ways to participate. That is starting a micro sanctuary, um, fostering rescued animals, volunteering or sanctuary sitting for a micro sanctuary, and then finally fundraising or donating to micro sanctuaries. Um, and now this is the most important part of the whole talk is I'm gonna to talk to you about something we just started, a brand new um, project called Finding Fosters Network. Um, and I'll tell you about a recent success story we just had. This is a pig named Beba. Um, she was in Berkeley, morbidly obese, um, couldn't even see because there was so much fat covering her eyes. Um, she was not well taken care of. And through the Finding Fosters Network, we were able to find a long-term happy home for Beba. Um, and that's Kitty with Beba on the right. And so the Finding Fosters Network right now is a WhatsApp chat. And it is some, a network that enables all of these ways that you can participate. Um, and it is right now a community of people who are alerting each other when there are animals in need and then coordinating uh, in, a, in a way to find homes for these animals, uh, both foster homes and long-term homes. So if you're thinking about starting a micro sanctuary, this is the place where you're gonna learn about animals that you can adopt. If you're thinking foster, if you're thinking about volunteering or micro sanctuary sitting, this is where you can make those connections and then if you're thinking about fundraising or donating, that's what we really need help with. We need help on social media, getting the word out about these animals, posting in the right groups to find them homes. Um, and so for folks who are interested, and, you, and what's great about this, you don't need to be in the Bay Area. You can be anywhere to join this because a lot of it's online. 
Um, you can put your phone number either in the chat, you can direct message me your, your name and phone number, and I will uh, add you to the WhatsApp chat. Um, or you can email um, sfbay-animalcare at dxe.io, um, which is right on the screen there. Um, so like I said, it's a great way to get involved if you're thinking of, of any of these ways of starting a micro sanctuary. You can always leave the chat. We won't, we won't have any hard feelings against you. Um, and it's, it's a really great way to get involved. So, so go ahead, message me your name, your number. Um, you can also email it here if you want to get involved. Um, great, so I'll just give people a second to do that. Um, okay. Well, thanks, Aaron. Um, thanks, Mallory. Um, thanks, folks. There's, there's a lot of messages. Um, anyway, I really appreciate it. Janice, thank you. Okay, I'm looking forward. All right, looking forward to adding you all to the chat. Uh, feel free to keep, keep adding your uh, numbers and messaging me. Um, I'll, be, I'll, I'll get these all at the end. Um, I want to make sure we have time for questions as well. Um, and we have a goal as the, micro, as the animal care working group in DXC uh, in the SFA of starting six micro sanctuaries this year. We already have two that are really promising and probably would be started if it wasn't for um, COVID-19. Um, and we had one uh, successful last year. So we're really hoping to expand, uh, really hoping to, to get this network going. Um, and so that, that is everything um, that I had. Um, I'm really happy to take questions. Um, there's always a ton of questions. Uh, so if people you, have questions for Andrew, you can put them in the chat. Um, and if they get lost, we'll try to, we'll, you know, we'll keep track of them so we can bring them up. So someone's asking, does FFN place animals nationwide, for example, a rescue in Delaware? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so far, we've only placed animals in California, but I think we'd be very interested in helping. It, do you have, um, for example, are you looking to adopt in Delaware or are there animals in need in Delaware? Well, either way, we can help you. Um, animals in need, potentially. Yeah, we're we're abs I mean, we're unlikely to be bringing animals from Delaware to California, but we're very happy, very happy to help you post and get you connected to the right places to find homes for animals. Uh, so feel free to join the chat and just post about the animals in need. Um, I see a message from Clarice. Um, who says that they live in a tiny house with access to a backyard, but it's not theirs and other animals use it. Um, are there animals that would happily live indoors? Rabbits, perhaps. They'd have free roam in the house. Yes, rabbits would be perfect for indoors. Um, yeah, I mean, you can make it work with chickens and pigs, uh, but it's not ideal. And I think rabbits are really a perfect micro sanctuary animal um, for indoors. And yeah, that's a good comment from Aaron too, rats as well. Uh, any other questions? Oh, uh, Margarita has a really good question. How's the interaction between animals? She has three cats and she wonders if they'll get along with the hens. So uh, we actually used to live with a cat um, and she got along just fine with our hens. They were both kind of mutually wary of each other um, I think cats are fine and dog, some dogs as well. Obviously, you don't want to be living, you don't want chickens to be living with a dog who has a strong prey drive. Um, that can be really dangerous, um, but cats, definitely possible. Let's see. 
Oh, Alba asked, have you ever had an aggressive rooster in your micro sanctuary? She's very curious. She has two, but they hate her and her family. They're the mafia. Um, they chase us and hurt her. Wow. Is there some way to help them? You know, a lot of roosters, unfortunately, because they have been bred for cockfighting, um, are just bred to be really aggressive. And that is, that is just how some roosters are. I, I don't know any ways to, to help you. I, I don't live with any roosters. Um, roosters are sadly really hard to home because they're loud and as, you, as you've experienced, quite aggressive too. Um, not all of them, of course. Some, some of them are really sweet. Um, but that's, that's a really tough question and I, I don't know what to say. Um, um, let's see. Bailey made a good point um, about helping uh, not just with fostering, but also with transporting, taking animals to the vet, et cetera. That's, that's a really good point. Um, mm, Michelle asked a really interesting question. When animals are rescued from slaughter or neglect situations, how long are they traumatized and what are the signs of trauma? Um, you know, our hens definitely had an adjustment period. There was a period where they were not interested in hanging out with us at all. They're, they were you know, much more just stuck to themselves and didn't care about us at all. And they, after about, I'd say three months, they started warming up to us, um, but it really depends on the degree of trauma that they experience. Um, but I think it's a really important, that, that a really important point that a lot of these animals are you know, living with potentially depression or PTSD from what they experience and that will be something that is stuck with them for a while. I think. Oh, there's, let's see. Let's see, I'm looking, there's a lot of good questions here. Uh, Joanna, feel free to call out any, if, if you see one in particular. Um, did you address the one about micro sanctuaries in colder climates? I think that's a good question. Um, can chickens be kept indoors happily in the winter? That's a great question. Um, I know people have insulated coops. You can do that. You can run some, like an electric line out and have a little like heater, um, in like a heat lamp in the top of the coop to keep them happy in the, in the winter. Um, they can definitely be indoors in the winter as well. Um, yeah, hens are actually pretty cold hardy. Um, now, I don't know if they're comfortable in the, whole, in the cold, but they're actually much more prone to overheating than being cold. Uh, so I live, I, I'm fortunate to live in a pretty mild climate where it doesn't get too hot or too cold. Um, I'll jump in because- Oh, sorry. Yeah, I used no, to live in ahead, Toronto go. in Canada where um, it does get very cold. And there actually was, um, there were a couple of places that, you know, would be considered micro sanctuaries. One had a kind of flock of chickens um, with an outdoor coop. And I mean, it was kind of like a shed. So in the winter, they did what Andrew's talking about. And they had electricity that ran out there and um, a heat lamp and stuff like that. Um, and I've also heard of people, you know, bringing chickens indoors and, you know, putting diapers on them or whatever, if you're going to keep them inside the house. So it sounds like it would be possible. Um, there's been a couple questions in the chat, Andrew, about the rescue process and people asking like one, how to, how to, you know, how do you actually get animals? Um, and then also kind of what legal risks might be associated with either rescuing them or, um, housing rescued animals. That's a really important question. Um, a lot of animals are actually abandoned or we don't know their full backstory. Um, and so there's little legal risk there. For animals who are ro rescued through either a mass rescue or a mass open rescue, um, you, can, you can basically choose how much legal risk you wanna have. So for example, I am very public that our hens came from Sunrise, that they were from an open rescue, um, I want people to know about the history that they what uh, of, that they have, um, that understand what they endured to get where they are, because uh, I think it's a much more um, compelling story for new folks who are new to activism. Um, now, I could have said also that I didn't know where they came from, 
Um, and that would be perfectly acceptable as well and gives you a lot of legal cover. Um, because if somebody, you know, somebody gives you these hens and you don't know where they came from, then it's not on, it, there's not a lot of legal risk that goes to you because you weren't the one at fault. You didn't, you weren't the one who rescued them. Um, so it's really up to you, I would say. Um, if, if you're really concerned about legal risk, uh, you can ask the people who are giving you animals to not disclose where they came from. Um, and then you are at a much lower legal risk because you just, you don't know where they came from and you're protected by that, um, by that lack of knowledge. Thanks. Um, there's another kind of comment slash question. Um, and I've seen some other comments like this in the chat, just about kind of, you know, the, the place for um, like sanctuaries, not micro sanctuaries, but sanctuaries that maybe are able to take bigger animals in. Um, and someone's asking if micro sanctuaries in cities are kind of primarily like their specific, you know, animals that maybe could, could be accommodated in, in cities and, um, you know, kind of what the place is for, uh, or where, where larger animals could be um, housed and what the place is for safety. That's a really good point. And yeah, I'm, I, reading some of these, I don't mean to imply at all that sanctuaries are not doing a good job or that they're not necessary. We absolutely need more, my, more sanctuaries and they have a huge important role in these animals' lives. Uh, I just want to highlight how micro sanctuaries can be a really effective form of sanctuary. Um, and that's a really good point. You're very unlikely to have a micro sanctuary with cows um, or really large, large animals like a, a factory farm sized pig. They're going to be the size of your couch and it's just probably not going to work. Probably not going to be able to have that legally due to zoning issues. Um, so there's absolutely need for, um, for sanctuaries that can take in large animals, no question about it. Um, what I'm advocating for is more individuals, instead of adopting a cat or a dog, um, although that's also a great cause, instead adopting a chicken or a pig. And just the effectiveness that you can have in that way in starting a conversation with your neighbors, with your community, in, in creating more hubs of activism in, in where you live. Um, but absolutely, we will always need sanctuaries for uh, large, large animals like cows and large pigs um, because, you know, and until we rescue them all, there's gonna be more. Um, there's a question about how, like what the difference is between taking uh, care of newborn animals versus more grown up ones. Um, and someone also is asking how long healthy hens typically live. Mm, that's a really good question. Um, I, I still like to make the analogy between cats and hens. If you have a healthy hen, they can live 10 years or longer. Um, they really can be long lived, especially some of the uh, more wild type like game hens, um, what are sometimes called heritage breeds. They tend to be a little healthier. They haven't been bred to just be these egg machines. And so they, they tend to um, be quite healthy. We're, we're trying to play some hens with a woman right now who said she has a hen who is 15 years old, which I think is really, that's, you know, that's showing exceptional care um, for that individual. So they can, they can live a long time. Um, and then in terms of newborn hens, um, we just don't, we don't get a lot of newborn hens. Um, you know, I know Deirdre recently uh, adopted some, and I think they had certain food requirements that were different from full-grown hens, but I actually don't have a lot of familiarity with that. Um, someone's asking if sheep can do well inside or if that's something that uh, wouldn't really work. <laughs> sheep? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know anyone who has sheep inside. I think that'd be really tough. Um, I think they would destroy your house eventually. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it. Um, and there's a question about how often does the birth control implant need to be administered? Um, for, it really depends on the laying drive of your hens. So we get the um, 4.7 milligram desloralin 
Um, there's also a 9.2 milligram, which is twice as strong. And so the one that we get is supposed to be like six months, but for our hens, it's closer to like three or four months, just because they have a really strong laying drive. They have a lot of hormones like coursing through their body, um, trying to get them to lay an egg every day. Uh, so for us, it's like I said, three to four months. Um, yeah, but for, for some hens, it may be as long as six. Cool. Um, it looks like there's a little bit of conversation in the chat about, um, you know, some folks were kind of talking about they want like more details on like really like, you know, what do I do tomorrow? Like step one oh, to start yeah. a micro sanctuary. And then some people are kind of, you know, um, saying that there's a lot more to it than just this presentation, obviously. And so um, I thought I would just kind of stress this point and maybe you can elaborate a little bit on this is kind of why you're asking for people to reach out to you um, because there is a lot of nuance and, and kind of one on one communication that needs to happen based on people's situations and um, the context of everything. So I don't know if you wanted to elaborate on that at all. Absolutely. Um, yeah, Joanna said it well. I'm happy to chat with people more. This training was really just to get people excited, to give you a taste of what's possible, what you can do on your own. Um, and, and there is a lot more to know um, and a lot to learn as well. Um, and we have a link here, dxc.io slash microsanctuary. Um, I'll, I'll show you where it goes. It goes to um, this, sorry, it goes to this page here um, as soon as it loads, where we have a little bit more about how we can help you get started um, with starting a micro sanctuary, uh, especially with hens, um, how we can, we can help visit your home, consult about a good space, about ways to predator proof your space, um, how to build a coop or buy a coop, um, all these sorts of things. And then um, we, have, we have an Instagram page that we, have, we try to have all our micro sanctuaries on. Um, oh, that's mail. Um, uh, that, well, that loads. Um, and then we also, most importantly, on this webpage, dxc.io slash micro sanctuary, is this link to chicken care links to the very bottom. Um, and that brings up um, um, that brings up this spreadsheet here. Um, uh, that has more links on it. And this gets into a lot of detail about what you would need to do tomorrow. Um, and none of these are quite step by step, but I think if you read through a lot of this, you'll get a sense for what you need to do. This was this first very first document um, is really helpful. It's about setting up a micro sanctuary in the Bay Area and sort of for, for our climate. Um, but we're happy to talk to you about sort of other climates and, and what can be what can be done there. Um, we have some coops we recommend, um, some ways to enrich their environment for the hens. Um, some estimates of the financial costs, so things like how much a monthly costs per hen, approximately. Um, a lot of information about chicken health. There's, there's a ton to know, um, but more important than anything is just having a good avian vet by you um, or, or one that you can take your hens to and that you trust. Um, and then, like I promised, there is this list of supplies for fostering at the very bottom here. And that's great if you're, if you're just trying to foster some hens. Um, and then lastly, uh, chicken, some information about chicken handling, some sort of basic, basic information about hens at the bottom. Um, so I, I hope that's helpful for folks. Please uh, email the uh, sfbay-animalcare at dxc.io if you have any questions, if you want to start your own. Um, we're happy to chat with you um, on the phone and, and get you started because we, we really have a goal of starting six micro sanctuaries. We'd love for you to be one of those six. Um, oh, and we also have an Instagram page. If you start a micro sanctuary, or if you have a micro sanctuary, uh, we have the at micro sanctuaries handle um, where we post a lot of cute photos and do, like I said, more of that sort of positive framing um, around animals. So if anyone else has um, any more questions, feel free to throw them in the chat. Um, Aaron asks, where can we reach you to ask further questions? Maybe you could just throw up this slide again here. 
Um, yeah, yeah, let me present this. So the link uh, on the slide, dxc.io slash microsanctuary, that will give you all the information, including this email address. But if you want to write down the email address, there it is. Mm -hmm. And a bunch of people are posting it in the chat too. <laughs> Thank you. So we'll do one last call for any final questions here or you know comments that people have. So it looks like it looks like the people have spoken and uh, looks like all that's left is some thank yous. Oh, um, this is a good question actually. Uh, should we be weary about infections from factory farmed animals? Ooh, that is a very relevant question these days. Um, factory farmed animals, the only thing you'd want to watch out for there is potentially some antibiotic resistant infections they might have. Um, so don't go, you know, rubbing your open wounds on their open wounds, anything silly like that. Um, you probably won't catch anything. Um, but yeah, if they do have an open infection, you really want to get that treated and you, you, you don't want to be touching it um, without washing your hands afterwards. Because unfortunately, due to the huge amount of antibiotic use on farms, there really is a, a large amount of antibiotic resistant infections and that you, you don't want to mess with. Yeah, someone's asking if their um, dog or like other animals in the home could get sick uh, as well. I mean, unlikely, um, you do want to make sure if you're getting animals, and this is something that we do, that they have, um, that they don't have lice or mites um, or worms. And uh, that's something that anyone that you get animals from, especially if it's us, should be able to help you with, or a vet can help you determine that as well. Um, now, I think those are specific to birds. I don't think they will spread to your cats or dogs. Um, but just to be safe, you may want to keep them separated until um, you can get them uh, to a vet to make sure that they don't have lice or mites. Someone else is asking um, if the hens are not implanted and they're still laying eggs, should they collect the eggs, feed them back, or leave the eggs to discourage the hens from laying more? That's a fantastic question. Uh, I, I should have covered that. Uh, so as long as you don't have a rooster around, um, you can, I would recommend breaking the eggs um, and feeding them back and you can feed them back raw um, or you can cook them and feed them back to the hens. But having that nutri nutrition, um, I think is, is really important for them because there's a huge amount of fat and protein in these eggs and they need, and calcium and they need to get that back. Um, additionally, you want to make sure that if you have a rooster that you're really, really being on top of collecting those eggs and crushing them um, because you, we don't want anyone to be breeding animals. There's way too many sick animals out there already or animals who need homes out there already. Uh, we don't want to be making more of them. Um, I have heard of people using fake eggs, like wooden eggs. Um, I, I don't personally use those. Uh, you may find them, if, if it makes your hens happier, then go for it. Someone asked if the chickens eat the shells of the eggs too. Yes. Yeah, and I will like crush them up really, really like intensely. So there's just little shell pieces left um, and they'll eat those. And yeah, they, they will eat the shells. Absolutely. Okay, well, thanks everyone for tuning in. It was great to see you all. And I appreciate all your questions and looking forward to uh, chat, with, chat with you all in the future. Yeah, thanks Andrew for that awesome presentation and for um, letting us all know a little bit more about micro sanctuaries. Some people, it was their first time learning what a micro sanctuary was. So um, I thought that was really cool. So yeah, that's it. Um, thanks everyone for joining. We've got so many thank yous going on in the chat. Um, let's all just take a moment to thank ourselves for being here. And um, yeah, it looks like we potentially might have some more micro sanctuaries to look out for in the future.
Um, so if, if you do start a micro sanctuary, hopefully you'll be in touch with, uh, with the micro sanctuary team and I'm sure they would love to see your photos as well so they can be shared on the Instagram account and I look forward to seeing those. Um, so that's it for today. Uh, someone's suggesting let's breathe. So I think that could be a good kind of closing exercise. Um, maybe we can all just take a, a unifying breath um, to feel our togetherness. I'm just gonna ask Andrew if you could stop sharing your screen. Uh, maybe, oh, oh I can stop it for you. There we go. Um, so if you are on a computer or even on your phone, you might be able to swipe and kind of see some more video screens. If you're on your computer, um, in the top right corner, you can click onto gallery view and you'll see a bunch of little squares instead of just one speaker. So we can kind of see more people. Um, so it's really cool to see all of your faces and we'll just take um, one, you know, last breath together and uh, we'll see each other all on the next call. So whether you join us tomorrow for the training or Saturday for the next assembly, um, thanks to you all for being here. And uh, yeah, we'll just close with a big breath. All right, thanks for joining everyone. Have a good night. Bye. Mm-hmm. <laughs>